Hi, I'm Kelsey Humphreys, and this is The Pursuit, where I help you in your journey, your hustle, and your climb to be your best self and put out your best work. After all, I'm still hustling for that too, guys. So I sit down and interview today's most successful celebrities, executives, and entrepreneurs, and I break down success for the rest of us. This is a Pursuit Profile episode, which features shorter interviews with rock star guests. While you may not yet know their name, you need to hear their story. In this episode, we'll learn from serial entrepreneur, Kenny Dichter. Kenny Dichter is the founder and CEO of the revolutionary new aviation company, Wheels Up. Wheels Up is a membership-based business that's seemingly everywhere lately due to partnerships with members like Serena Williams and Ricky Fowler. Before Wheels Up, he founded Marquee Jet in 2001. That program generated over $4 billion in revenue, culminating in its sale to Warren Buffett's NetJets in 2010. Then Dichter co-founded Tequila Avion, an ultra-premium brand that was acquired in July 2014 for over $100 million. His first business started in his dorm room in Wisconsin, and now he's disrupting an industry from the heart of Times Square in New York City. I met with him there to learn how he built and sold one successful business after another. All right, thank you for joining me for another episode of The Pursuit. I am here with Kenny Dichter, the CEO and founder of Wheels Up, which I know you've seen and heard of Wheels Up because it is everywhere lately. Just thank watch you. a sporting event or watch anything with cool people, Wheels Up's gonna be somewhere in the background. So I'm excited to talk to you today. Thanks for having me. But what I love is you're such a serial entrepreneur, just over and over and over again. But I wanna go back to the beginning and then we'll get into the success of Wheels Up. But start back in college, you started a little shop and called, then called Bucky's. Bucky's, which then expanded and exploded. And I mean, that was pretty much your first business. What do you think was the key to the success of you as a young entrepreneur getting started? Because that business you ended up selling and it moved, mm -hmm. it moved on to great success. Yep, I would say, first off, being an entrepreneur, you have to be comfortable starting things and always getting no's. And right when you hear no, that's a good word for an entrepreneur. You gotta then keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, never take no for an answer, never quit and uh, always be flexible with your business plan. But the truth is, is everybody saw what you saw, then they would do it. Yeah. So uh, that, that's just uh, my, my first point. But uh, I was lucky at the University of Wisconsin, um, great school, had a super chancellor at the time named Donna Shalala, who mm -hmm. became a very good friend of mine. And uh, another good lesson is befriend the people at the top. <laughs> oh yeah, that uh, is good. Befriend the people at the top. But we started a little clothing operation right out of my dorm room uh, oh, to wow. start. And uh, for any entrepreneur out there, the best thing you could ever do is start a business in a dorm room because you don't have any overhead. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, things started to get expensive we, when we moved into our first store at 555 State Street, right in the center of campus at Wisconsin. And again, I would say to entrepreneurs, you start something, you, you form it, you make it big, you always have to be willing to sell it and move on to the next. Hmm. Never want to hold on to it too long. That's interesting. We'll get to that because you've done that multiple times. Sure. But so you went from that and you had like a clothing business and then you were in some music distribution business. Sure. Then you end up in aviation. How did that happen? Well, it's, it's simple. The, the clothing <laughs> business was something I started in college and uh, two blocks from here on 40th and 7th was my first business uh, after college. It was a clothing business called Street Buzz oh. and Why Work. It was like casual clothing. Uh, and what happened was, is one day while I'm set up on 40th and 7th, uh, one of my partners, a f partner to be comes in and pitches me an idea about a sports music business that he wanted to start. Mm -hmm. And his name was Jesse Itzler, and he was in business with the New York Knicks. Uh, okay. He was writing theme songs for professional sports teams, but he didn't really have a business guy with him to figure yeah. out how he could turn this into a money-making operation. And that goes to another important point. Yep. There are a lot of great ideas and a lot of great <laughs> movie scripts. you got to know how to make them. Yes. So at the end of the day, we put together a business plan, which is critical to any entrepreneurial venture you're going to do. you got to have a roadmap. And by the way, that roadmap can change. Hmm. But we took this idea while I was doing the clothing over here and started a sports music and marketing company called Alphabet City. Mm -hmm. And we, the New York Knicks was our first team and project. The second was the Chicago Bulls. And... I think we got to thank Michael Jordan for uh, mm. his winning. <laughs> uh, but those two records uh, that we did, one with the Knicks and one with the, Bill, the Bulls, uh, that put us on the map and enabled us to sell our business after two successful records with, uh, with those teams mm -hmm. to a gentleman named Bob Sillerman, who had a company called SFX. SFX was, at the time, the largest 
purveyor of, you know, sort of concert and live events. Mm. So he put together a big roll-up with uh, a lot of companies of which he bought our company. And uh, that's how I got from clothing to this music distribution and record right. business. And then finally, at this company, SFX Entertainment, uh, the guys and gals that sold in, they made a lot of money. That means they didn't go to LaGuardia or Kennedy anymore. <laughs> they went to Teterboro, right. Van Nuys, and, yeah. and they were flying privately. Uh, I was asked to be a guest on a flight. Uh, David Falk took me out to California hmm. for a Michael Jordan Spike Lee commercial. Wow. And uh, what I didn't realize is I was like the sixth or seventh person invited. When we got to 10,000 feet and everybody wanted their catering, they looked back at me, and I ended up, I was the steward, even though they didn't tell me. I was the person that was oh, opening up the sodas and, and delivering the chicken fingers to everybody oh, wow. on the plane. But it was still better than flying commercial. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, after doing this uh, on a few flights, I looked at my partner, Jesse, somewhere over Oklahoma City. I think that's where you're from. Yes. And uh, I looked at him. I said, I think we're in the wrong business. we got to get into aviation. Mm -hmm. This is a great business. And we had already done the sports music thing. Yeah. And, uh, I just want to pause because... How did you go? I mean, that is just crazy. You went from your college dorm room. Let's maybe just, how did you go from college dorm room to having a shop here in New York City? Okay, good question. Yeah. So in my college dorm room, we started selling Wisconsin flavored t-shirts. Right. We moved that across the street from the dorm to State Street. So I had a physical location, 2,800 square feet. Mm -hmm. And I took a business that was the dorm room business and made it somewhat institutional. Right. When I graduated, five years, five summers, it was not an easy, uh, <laughs> not, as, not as an easy journey uh, getting out of school. I always <laughs> like to fully disclose to the audience, I'm a low SAT, low GPA entrepreneur, <laughs> 1050 on the SATs, 28 at Wisconsin, which is proof that anything can happen in America. <laughs> anything can happen in America. But what happened was, is I met a friend's dad uh, who was visiting uh, a good friend of mine at college who was a big entrepreneur in the Garmin Center. Mm -hmm. And he saw the stuff that we were able to execute on the t-shirt side. And he was actually somebody that took me in and backed me wow. on, on 40th and 7th in a real live showroom selling real live accounts. And what was once a college t-shirt business became, uh, we were selling to the, the shop co's in Green Bay, Wisconsin, who had hundreds of stores. Uh, at the time, Sears was a powerful t-shirt retailer. Uh, we were selling Walmart, uh, so we were mm. using the showroom and using the resources that uh, my friend's dad had uh, mm. to, to do something bigger. So you must be what they call like good in a room, like you and that guy's dad. I mean, do you have maybe some selling techniques or presentations to get him to buy into you? And then again and again, it's, very, it's very, your... It's very simple. Never, don't, never take no for an answer. <laughs> if you're an entrepreneur, the word no, you know what it means? Not now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, you never can take no for an answer. And I think you have to have a belief, a belief in yourself, mm. and everyone should have this, that they could sit at the big table. You know, if you mm. believe, I like to say fake it till you make it. Yeah. You know, no one told me that I couldn't do business with my friend's father who had a big garment business. I believed it. So he, <laughs> he, sh he should believe it. Awesome. So let's go back to aviation. So you founded or co-founded Marquee Jet. Uh -huh. And how, what was the business model for that? Very simple. Uh, you ever been to Starbucks? Yes. 50% plus of their business today is happening on prepaid cards. Mm. You know, you go in, mm -hmm. you have a card for Starbucks. Right. That does two things. One is you're basically pledging your loyalty. Most people that have Starbucks card aren't, aren't going to Mike and Tony's Coffee right. across right. the street. They made a brand decision. What's great for Starbucks right. is they get the prepaid money up front. Mm -hmm. So they know they have your money. They know you're coming to get your coffee eventually. <laughs> right. We created a Starbucks card for private aviation called the Marquee Jet Card. Okay. So it's very simple. If I'm selling you, I'm going to sell you 25 hours in a Citation 5 Ultra, which was our entry level plane to Marquee Jet, and you give me $109,000, 100, $109,900, 1099. Mm. So you give me that, you get your card, I get the money, and you call me, and in 12 hours' notice, I will get you an airplane anywhere you want in the continental United States. And wow, cool. the hours were taken off like a Starbucks card. Right. If you fly Oklahoma City to Dallas, yeah. you don't have 25 hours anymore. You have 24. Right. And then when you're done with your card, I call you when you have two hours left. And I said, hey, ready to renew? Send me another 109.9 .9 and we're <laughs> set to go. Uh, made a handshake with Richard Santulli and Warren Buffett, who owned NetJet at the time, that became our partners. We sold $4 billion worth of that Marquee Jet card between the handshake we made with Santulli and Buffett in February 01 until the time that we sold the company back to NetJet, our mm -hmm. partner, in November 2010.
Wow. Crazy. Well, let's, let's drink to that. Let's have okay. a little. Okay. Cheers. Cheers to that. <laughs> um, my cup is empty, guys. Don't tell anyone. Okay. Um, so let's go. Then you, you sold that. Then you had some tequila. Then you sold. Why do you keep selling your businesses? Well, I think that, you know, you have to be willing. If you love something, you got to be willing to set it free. And I think that if you take investors in, which I do, it's my money, it's my partner's money, but we also have taken outside people's monies. When you have outside money and outside investment in your firm, you have to be prepared to part with it because the truth mm -hmm. is you need something which every entrepreneur should know. Write this down, exit. You have to have an exit strategy. <laughs> and if people put money alongside you, you can't stay in a business like a family business for 50, 100, 200 years. Mm. You have to be willing. And the average life cycle of these things is, call it five to seven years. It takes five years to build any good business. And when you have something good, you know what they say about a restaurant business? What? When they give the restaurant five stars, sell it. Because oh. it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, so right. That's how it is with all businesses. So explain now Wheels Up business model and how it's different. Because it's okay. pretty disruptive. And explain why it's disruptive okay. too. Okay. Well, the first thing is, is we wanted to, what I learned at Marquee Jet and NetJet, that private aviation was for very wealthy people and very big businesses. <laughs> the entry level at $8,000 an hour is heavy. Yeah. We wanted to see if there was a way that we could democratize private aviation. Shared flights, hot flights and put together a membership model that felt more like Costco or Netflix or mm -hmm. Amazon Prime. So you'd, you pay a nominal figure in our business, which is $17,500, which for somebody walking on the street, it might be a big number. For someone flying private, it's not a big number. Right. So for $17,500, you can join Wheels Up. And then instead of the $8,000 an hour I was selling in my last life, we put together an airplane uh, with the Beechcraft Corporation based in uh, Kansas, Wichita. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have an airplane called the King Air 350i that seats eight people. I, I like to say it's the flying SUV. Mm -hmm. It was never put into fleet format before. And we can deliver an hour, eight seats, for $3,950. So almost 50% okay. of what we were selling as the entry level before it's like when flat screen TVs were once like $11,000. Mm -hmm. Now you can go to a Best Buy and get them for $8.99. We're doing that to private aviation. We're democratizing it. We're making it available to more people. How do people respond? Like the, I mean, do, do, do people in private aviation like that there's now a Costco version? Of course. Um, I do. think at the end of the day, if, if it costs me $39.50 to fly to Boston with... Uh, with you and I plus four people mm -hmm. versus, you know, down the, down the street, it'll cost you 8000 for the same flight. We still got to Boston. I'd rather yeah. pay four than eight okay. in, in today's world. I would say that we have the smartest aviation solution uh, going today, and, and proof is in the, in the numbers because uh, I was going to say, as an entrepreneur, <laughs> the numbers are your numbers. You are your numbers. You can have great plans and great ideas, but at the end of the day, your results are your results. Remember that. Yeah, so that's your great advice. Your numbers are your numbers. Uh, we have 3,000 members that have joined the Wheels Up Club. We're doing, on a busy day, over 100 revenue flights. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, we're, uh, we're, our, our members and our action on our fleet are telling us that we have a successful business. And ultimately, if you treat your employees, which we do, like rock stars, they treat the members like rock stars. So if everybody's feeling good about the brand, uh, it's also a great thing that you need to do to build a great culture and business. Awesome. And you guys are about to have your three-year anniversary, so congratulations. All the success is amazing. Three-year anniversary is coming up, but what's really exciting, that's a month away, mm -hmm. is we were able to raise $175 million in equity and $265 million of debt. We're actually 295 now that I think, <laughs> think it through. It's $465 million has been put to, to, put to work in wow. this business in less than 36 months. Wow, that's incredible. Um, you've probably noticed there's tons of subscription businesses exploding oh, sure. now. I mean, it's just everywhere. What advice do you have for someone who thinks they have the next great subscription business idea? There's only one thing that matters in a subscription business. It's not the getting the people to sign up. It's how strong is your retention rate? Mm. Can you keep them? Because the value of a subscription business is one metric, retention. Mm. Can you retain 90, 95% of the people? Can you keep them in the, right. in the business? 
because I would tell you the cost of finding a new member versus replacing one that's leaving right. is astronomical, or keeping one, I'm sorry. So the cost of keeping a member is a lot less than finding, yeah, a new, finding, finding new, new ones. One. Yeah. Awesome. Well, looking back, you've done you know, so many businesses. You're a true serial entrepreneur. What do you feel like has been the best part of this journey mm -hmm. and the worst part? Um, I would say the best and the worst are the same thing. <laughs> is uh, If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to love action. Mm. And I would say action when it's great action and the adrenaline you get from these businesses and, and the exciting piece, that's an unbelievable positive upside to the business. I would say that if you want to get eight hours of sleep and be a balanced person in the world, I'm not sure that entrepreneurial, <laughs> uh, you know, an entrepreneurial path is one you want to go on. I think the biggest challenge in the business is that uh, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day right. and the action's tough to turn off. So I yeah. would say that you really want to make sure if you're going to go down an entrepreneurial path that you are also prepared to have some balance in your life. Mm. But I would say getting to that balance, and I'm still struggling with it, is uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, I think we all struggle with it. A lot of people talk about it. I'll tell you what, if there's an entrepreneurial idea that will make a trillion dollars, the first trillion dollar company in the world, invent an eighth day. <laughs> yes. F figure yes, out how to please. get an eighth day into the world <laughs> that everybody can kind of get their, their crap together yes. in that eighth day. I think that you'd make a zillion dollars if you figure that out. I agree. I want that. Uh, before we wrap up, I have to ask about how you guys are everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, maybe explain how did you go about getting all of the relationships with the celebrities mm -hmm. and, you know, what's your marketing strategy and all the, just some insights into that. Okay. First bullet point, celebrities are people too. Mm -hmm. If you treat a celebrity like a regular person and a regular person like a celebrity, you got it mm -hmm. made. That's a very important piece of our business because awesome. that's how we do it. Um, I would say, listen, I, you know, it's the power of nice. There was a book we read once uh, that was handed out to our at a sales meeting called The Power of Nice. If mm -hmm. you're nice to everybody, you never have to worry about you know, going around this corner or seeing right. this person. I think as an entrepreneur, you touch a lot of people mm -hmm. and you always want to be good to people. And I think if you're always consistently good, and fair and keep your integrity high and do what you say you're going to do and never hurt anybody, I think it's really important in building a network business like we're building. Um, what kind of agreement do you have? Are, there, are, they, are you sponsoring them? Oh, you're talking about specifically yeah, our celebrity? Yeah, all the athletes or, and yeah, all those people. Well, we, we like to consider ourselves, you know, not a celebrity or a, that kind of brand. We're a winner's brand. Oh, that's so, nice. so, so if you're an entrepreneur like uh, Aaron Andrews, who does the, the football games, uh, for Fox, and then she does Dancing with the Stars, and she uses Wheels Up to get from A to B. Yeah, she's a winner. You know, then I look at Irwin Simon, who was the chairman and CEO of Hain Celestial, the largest organic foods company in the world. Hmm. He's a winner. Then, of course, you can point to Serena Williams, who Obviously who just did it at Wimbledon, a <laughs> yeah. uh, big winner. Yeah. Russell Wilson, J.J. Watt, the list goes on. Um, I think everybody in our business is a, a celebrity in their own right. But every ambassador, the people that you're talking about that are helping us build mm -hmm. our business, doing advertisement and whatnot, every ambassador joins the club for 17.5. Okay. They then tell us, okay, I need 50 hours of flight time in a year. We might say, purchase the 50. And, you know, if you're, for example, you know, Sam Query, who just beat Djokovic in the uh, Wimbledon, mm -hmm. or if you're Graham McDowell and you're wearing the logo on the back, or, you know, or your Serena Williams and your ads, we say, if you're going to do some work uh, for us and help us build the company, we'll throw you some bonus hours. We have some great currency. We never pay dollars uh, mm, for our okay. ambassadors. We always work in our own currency. And if somebody was willing to help us with our business, any of those celebrity types, you know, what we like to do is give them the best thing we can give them, which is, uh, your is hours, hours right? and lift. I would think you would probably get inundated with people who want you to sponsor them. Does that happen? Well, like, yeah, I mean, our because I just feel like you're a really cool brand right now. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I, again, like I said, I, I, I like to think that we're a cool brand, but I, I always want to be winners are never going to go out of style. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're cool, I, I like to say when I look at businesses as, a, as an investor and an entrepreneur, is it a, a trend or is it a fad? Now, you always mm -hmm. want to invest in the trend. Mm -hmm. I, I will say one thing. I think for the next hundred years or maybe even next thousand, winning is always going to be a trend. <laughs> right. It's never going to be a fad to be a winner. So. We like to look at ourselves as a winner's brand. Of course, winner's brands attracts people that want to win right. or are, are winning. They want to be part of the club. So, yeah, we get calls from every corner of the earth on people that want to associate with us. And I think we're very careful on who we choose to help us sell the brand. We want, it, uh, we want these people to look like 
uh, you know, like, like we look, which is, you know, high integrity people that like to win. Yeah, so I guess that would be part of your advice for someone out there, maybe a young athlete or somebody watching who wants to be sponsored. What would your advice be to them? I mean, I guess make sure the brand's a good fit, like you just said. Of course, and I would just say it, it really comes down to belief. Hmm. You know, if, if, if I love when I look at a product and I can actually believe on the screen that that person isn't just getting paid to, to drink it or eat it or wear yeah. it, but they actually believe in the product. So right. I would say to anybody out there, that's trying to associate with any brand, whether you're a young athlete, a young entertainer, a young business person, a young entrepreneur, I like belief. You know, I always say that one person with belief is stronger than 100,000 people with just interest. Oh, that's good. I like that. It's true. Okay, so lastly, what is your number one piece of advice for an entrepreneur who's just getting started? I would say I'll give you a couple of pieces. Yeah. One is if you're gonna go at a real big idea most entrepreneurial ventures are undercapitalized. Try to make sure that you have the right, whether it's friends and family money, mm. whether it's money you're getting from a VC, whatever you think you need, go times that by one and a half or two. So make sure you have the right capitalization. But I think even before capitalization, you have to really think through your idea and you have to distill it. You have to have a game plan. There's so many people, mm -hmm. there's difference between an idea and a game plan. You know, ideas are very fragile. They can break, they can yeah. move. Game plans and, and, and business plans and battle plans, those, those are concrete. Those you can, you can point to and you can execute. You know where you go. Mm -hmm. You know, you jump to the next area. You know, you follow a plan. I don't think, uh, I don't think you can execute anything without a plan. What but, are some mistakes you see young entrepreneurs making in their plan, in their business plan? Because I'm sure you get pitched all the time now. And oh, everyone yeah. wants to tell you their idea. I think most uh, you know, young entrepreneurs, I think, need to talk to successful people, whether they're successful in anything that they've done, to really get perspective before they lay their plan down. Mm -hmm. Because they may not have the experience, the real world experience, mm -hmm. the people that have done it, they can identify the roadblocks and the obstacles that they're going to hit. And you know, plans are also fragile. Ideas are very fragile. <laughs> plans are fragile. Mike Tyson, do you know who he is? The, mm -hmm. old, the boxer. Yeah. He had a famous line about game plan. He said, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that, ha that happens in business. It happens in boxing. Awesome. So I think that you have to be willing to, when things aren't going your way, as Tyson said, he's a boxer by trade. He mm -hmm. gets punched in the face for a living. Um, you have to be able to pivot. When, 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 you know, when you're getting thrown lemons, you got to figure out how to make lemonade. Man, there is so much we can learn from that interview. But here are my keys to success from my interview with Kenny Dichter. Number one, embrace rejection. Entrepreneurs should expect for people to tell them no because you're innovating and you're visionary and you're doing things people don't understand yet. However, to embrace rejection doesn't mean accept rejection. Dichter says, never take no for an answer. Number two, value relationships. Dichter went from one industry to another because he had relationships and business partners and a network that he built as he went. And he clearly values his employees. His advice is to make sure that you never burn a bridge because you're going to touch a lot of lives as an entrepreneur. So have integrity and do what you say you're going to do. Number three, create a clear map. There are some entrepreneurs who are not big on business plans. Kenny Dichter is not one of them. He says you absolutely must have a clear plan because a great idea is not enough. And lastly, know your numbers. He says that a great idea and even a great business plan aren't enough. You simply have to have the results, the membership, the sales. You've got to know your numbers because that's what matters. Man, so much good advice. Thank you so much. I'm Kelsey Humphreys here with Kenny Dichter, and this has been The Pursuit.